You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 78, Behind the Scenes with EOS 42 and the Shintai Delegation Platform. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and I've got a very interesting guest for you today. Uh, David Packham joins us. He is a co-founder of EOS 42, which is a block producer candidate based in London. He's been active in the EOS community for around six months, and he and his team are building a token delegation market called Shintai. So, David, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Hey, Ash, it's great to meet you. Hi. Yeah, so give the crowd just a little background on who you are and really how you came into the whole crypto and EO space. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, uh, I have a background in asset management and finance, although originally that, that was uh, from a technology background. So uh, a lot of my time that I spent uh, prior to to really getting into the whole crypto space was uh, was playing around and, and trying to enhance trading systems for large banks and institutions. And for me, actually, I, I was doing pretty well in life until about 2008 um, when, <laughs> when, when everything started to change for everybody. Um, but that also was a, a pretty important time in my life for realizing that these great institutions I was working for were actually not doing I, in my view, good in the world. So it was a really big moment for me in terms of having to reassess where I was adding value in life or was I adding value indeed or not. And um, so that that was actually the natural driver as to why when I found out more about what decentralization technologies like uh, blockchain actually were, it, it was an immediate draw for me because I could see the potential to completely transform the financial system. Um, that was my initial driver looking into the whole side. It wasn't Bitcoin and money for me. It was actually, um, I can see the potential right here to re-engineer the entire financial system for the, for the benefit of everybody, which was, it, it's good when you've been on the inside, you can see it more clearly probably. Um, so, so that was certainly how I first got into this. But if you, in, in terms of EOS itself, um, and maybe we, we'll do a quick quiz and I'll ask you what you think it stands for. But um, EOS itself, uh, I got into it via Ian Grigg. Who is one of the uh, one of the block one? Uh, well, I, I would say partners. I think he's a consultant now for them, but he um, he's been quite instrumental in the governance side. Uh, and governance is a huge part of a dis distributed system like this. And uh, so it, it was actually in Grig and a presentation he gave about a year ago that, that first got me into EOS. Yeah, so did you think, I, I also came from a bit of a banking background. I was an engineer for seven years and learned Austrian economics and fell in love with gold and silver before cryptocurrencies were a thing. And actually, and my audience has heard this a thousand times, but I moved to the Caribbean to work for a guy named Peter Schiff to build a gold and silver backed bank because I, like you, didn't think that the banks had our best interest in mind. And I thought we were going to change the world from the inside out and use gold and silver as free market money. Did you try to stay in the banking system to fix it? Or did you instantly like, did you quickly notice what was happening and get out and try to start adding value in the marketplace elsewhere? Well, actually, my, uh, my wife and I decided to uh, go and set up a frozen yogurt business instead. <laughs> nice. From banking to frozen <laughs> yogurt. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was, it was an idea of like, we both want to go the entrepreneurial route. Let's actually do something and finally pick a business that, that's got a model that might work and just get the hell out of this sector. It uh, didn't, didn't work out long term because the weather in the UK is so lousy, but that's fine. The whole sector kind of boomed and then but went bust. So it was a good, good lesson for us in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges of running a physical bricks and mortar business. Once you've tried food retail, I don't think you're going to ever get a tougher environment to, to try and set up in. So that was, that was important lessons for me. Um, but uh, that, that was the initial reaction. But I, I ended up gravitating back into what I was a, a professional in because that's what pays the bills um, and the last few years then was spent doing very tedious regulatory programs of work but it, it, it's it's a great example if you see some of the um some of these diagrams what's it, there's a japanese concept isn't there where, where you try and find the the, the center spot it, it's called ikigi or, or and um hmm. uh yeah and it's ultimately you know i was paid well but zero satisfaction or feeling right. exactly value right in the world right, right. and uh, 
so so that's certainly was my initial response off the back of that and did that drive you into cryptocurrencies or what was your entry point into cryptocurrencies themselves uh so yeah that that pretty much was the driver i was i was looking to find something to to actually do as a as a follow-up business and i'd been looking at bitcoin on and off since about 2013 and hadn't really paid it enough attention um and the more i started to hear about blockchain as the the build-up of hype started to to kick in in about 2015 2016 the more i started looking into its its potential um to completely change uh the financial system and, and that naturally started to flow off itself as i as the, it, i shut the other business down and started to look ahead and think what am i going to do with the rest of my life here um, it, it just for me felt a natural avenue point to actually start focusing my energies on as opposed to something an ice cream salesman, right? So, uh, you yeah, know, and uh, so, so that was, that was all well and good. But as, as with most people who've got into crypto, you start knowing very little and you, you have a steep upward learning curve probably for about the first six months in the space. And sure. I went along to a number of the conferences and said virtually nothing. I did a lot of listening and, and no talking, um, which I think is the right thing to do when you, mm. you get in there. Um, and sat through numerous ICO pitches. And, um, and pretty quickly, you know, a guy walked on the stage, you got a round of applause from half the, uh, the techies in, in the audience. And, uh, and I instantly thought that this guy is, is obviously important to, to get that kind of reaction. And uh, it was Ian Grigg, and he was introducing a pretty boring sounding prospect, which was EOS. Well, what is EOS? Um, it, you know, and then it starts to go into the detail, and you start to realize this is actually a distributed operating system. And then, as you learn more, of course, you realize about the flaws of Ethereum, despite it being a great idea, and uh, its scaling issues and the transaction cost issues. And when you then turn around and actually look at the underlying design mechanisms of EOS, in theory, it can fix all of that. And sure, and that sure. that's the most exciting part for me, and why it I. It, it effectively, I, I, the, although I was looking at lots of different um, prospects early on, it, it um, became my focal point of interest uh, in crypto for that reason, because it, it seems by far the most likely Gen 3 blockchain to deliver on the potential. And, yeah, uh, I, absolutely. You know, and I, I've been pretty active in the Steam community um, for quite some time. I got introduced to that just by a friend and mid 2016 and i didn't even know who dan lermer was i had heard back in 2013 that you were 14 that quote you could short the dollar in bit shares but i didn't know what bit shares was and i didn't ever take a real look at it and i started really researching what dan had built and i saw steam as this blockchain that was very specific for social media and then bit shares was this blockchain that came out around the same time that ethereum did and you could ICO on a creature on tokens. And coming from the inside of the offshore banking space, I could see very quickly the parallels that BitShares offered to what the offshore banking space, or I guess just banking in general, offers. You know, uh, being able yeah, to yeah. do, do uh, create loans. You know, leverage your assets to loan yourself money, roll out yeah. your own, roll out your own tokens. It it was a decentralized exchange within the wallet, which I found amazing. And I couldn't believe that more people weren't using this. And the more I studied, the more I started learning about delegated proof of stake and how it was way different than proof of work, of course, which I think is, is on its way out. Um, but what the differences were between delegated proof of stake and proof of stake, meaning that it's not just who holds the tokens, it's a much larger community driven aspect of voting actually casting votes that are weighted to how much how many tokens you stake basically it reminds me of like the united states back uh when we won our independence from some country across the atlantic but <laughs> yeah no you, I, can, I can guess yeah. <laughs> but you had to own land in order to vote for a long time you know only landowners can vote and I always thought that that was very strange when I was in high school and college, but now that I see this in the voluntary nature of a delegated proof of stake system, it makes sense that the people that contribute capital and stake their claim and buy into the community, and they're not just passers-by, those are the people in your community that you want voting to, to change and influence your community. And you know, going through the STEAM system and understanding STEAM witnesses, I, it really started clicking with me on the power that EOS was going to bring to the table. You know, you mentioned Ethereum and 
I, I loved Ethereum, right? I mean, I, I can remember it back in 2014 and it was a lot of people were very hesitant about it. You know, back then it was back in 2013, 14, it was Bitcoin's going to do everything. We're, we're going to unbank the bank. We may bank the unbank. We're going to do micro transactions. We're going to do big transactions, settlement, you know, all this. And when Ethereum came out, I was like, wait a second, my, my development background really helped me understand, oh, you can actually program and write to this and create apps on it, which blew me away. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about the community aspect of delegated proof of stake and, and EOS. I mean, already the community is building and starting to try to influence and offer services. And, and then tell me about what a block producer is in a delegated proof of stake system and how that fits into the community equation. Yeah, well, well before I, I, I come to that, I'll just add, I think you've summarized uh, delegated proof of stake really well. Um, part of the inherent design of it though, uh, Dan Larimer is, is a big one for trying to uh, ensure people understand this concept of willful ignorance. Um, willful ignorance is ultimately this concept that if you don't have investment um, in your vote, you, you are not going to invest the time to educate yourself to make an informed vote necessarily because actually the sensible thing is why, why am I going to spend hours understanding the complexities of the underlying issues that are, to make an informed vote that's best for the overlying the underlying ecosystem if I've got one token or maybe right. five you know but, but the point is if I hold a massive stake you've, you've got so much to potentially lose you are going to spend that time really understanding what you're voting for and, and so yeah it's following on from what you're saying there with the, with the landowner example that analogy is good for, for saying you know when you've really got something to lose in the ecosystem you should in theory make a much more informed vote um, so yeah in terms of it therefore a block producer um, in terms of, of, of where it sits within this um, they're, they're effectively the guardians of the network um, they are going to they're going to be the, the network custodians for block production but they're, they're far more than that they are elected by the uh, the token holders so there is a very strong incentive for them to align in their own interests with the communities and the voters uh, in theory they are in continual competition with other block producers to in uh, as such um, actually generate out uh, rewards back to the community in, in and there's a big debate about what rewards to the community could actually entail um, we can maybe come on to that in terms of that because my view of a block producer may be different from others um, but whatever those rewards may be um, that is one of the big things that uh, the block producers are, are need, need to provide they need to provide security to the network resist you know a credible infrastructure plan that shows uh, their capability to scale with the network as it requires um, they they need to uh, have a global team to support the community globally. We're not anymore in this this age of just saying, look, it's this narrow English speaking world or or you know Chinese speaking. It's it's everybody. And in mm -hmm. theory, they need to to be there to also implement arbitration decisions as well. So it's not for them to necessarily get involved in that. But where we get to the point where um, EOS has, uh, should we say, um, controversial decisions. We're going to be in a point where, in theory, we have an arbitration system that actually can undo. Let's let's say an example might be the parity wallet hack, right? It, that's happened on Ethereum, where right. all the money's frozen. Uh, rather than a hard fork, that would go to arbitration. Arbitration would make a decision, and the block producers would therefore implement that and either, for example, undo it or, or not undo it, depending on the arbitration result. But in theory, it allows uh, a network like this to avoid hard forks um, as the dispute resolution. Yeah, I've often mentioned how, you know, we see all these hard forks off of Bitcoin. And the reason for that is that the token holders have very little, if any, voice over the decisions of the network, the decisions on what code is run, um, what upgrades, right? The, the miners, the, they say that the miners, you know, that they have to succumb to the wishes of the token holders. But I just don't think that's the case because there's no direct relationship. The miners are the people who have the hardware and can get the cheapest electricity to try to mine the coins and secure the network. But why are we leaving up such an important role in a community to the ones that can find the cheapest electricity? Why don't we allow the people in the community, the entrepreneurs, the people who are building trust, just like parallels into reality. I mean, not reality, but like real life, like it, every day to day life. 
people build up credibility in a society and they start getting elevated to more and more responsibility and they're respected. This is how EOS works. And this is also to a bit lesser extent, this is how Steam works as well uh, and BitShares. You're gonna vote on the people that you feel aligned to and that has earned your trust. And these are basically the people that you entrust to run the system that is in charge of organizing and maintaining your digital society. So I guess let, let's, before we jump into how block producers try to set themselves apart, let's very quickly talk about um, how block producers um, offer, I guess, offer basic resources to the network and how that supports and helps grow the community. Yeah, I mean, in terms of resources to the network, um, I mean, I'll give you an example of, of what we're looking at doing at the moment. We're having to uh, consider risk is a big part of what we are. We, we have to consider um, the political environment we're in right now. The UK is, is actually very benign. I've already had engagement discussions with the FCA, which is the Financial Conduct Authority here, because they need to understand what an EOS token is. Is it a security or is it a utility token? That impacts how they will necessarily regulate us as a block producer located there. Um, so getting consensus between ourselves and a regulator ensures that we've got a more benign regulatory environment further down the line. However, you know, as a, as a credible sell to any voters, you have to look, step back and say, look, here is our backup plan for that worst case scenario. So even before we get to the technical offering, how have we actually structured ourselves to enable ourselves to pivot out of this locale if there was an attack on, on the network? So let's say a new political party gets in, they're totally anti-crypto, we're gonna ban the lot, we're gonna shut down anything in that industry. They raid you overnight, they, sh they raid your, your, your physical hardware servers in the country. Uh, in theory, right, if you're just incorporated there, they, they can take you out, they could take your backup server out that's also in the UK, they could take all your money, you're taken out. That, right. that, that weakens the network. So instantly we have to think about where we're going to incorporate that gives us that, in, that independence. Um, and also you have to think about the, the offerings from a, from a hardware perspective. Data centers and, and physical hardware are going to be the, the highest performance. They're also expensive. But you probably need to, in my view, uh, combine that with a uh, one or two reserves in other countries, which are probably cloud-based. Because again, you've got that diversity um, to protect the network in, the, in those situations. Probably also then with, with the majority of your reserve funds being held offshore in, in a location, you've got that ability too to say, right, that's a shame you, you've become hostile, but now we will simply just pivot and relocate to Germany or, Bar hey, maybe Bali actually. But uh, <laughs> It's a little know. hot here. Yeah, maybe a little hot for the uh, the service, but but the point is right. It, it, it's that that's one of the biggest single things, and then we have to look ahead at all the things that are being talked about with EOS. So, you know, the mainnet goes live. It's single thread. It's going to maybe offer perhaps seven thousand transactions per second, let's say, which to give oh, you my, only, my understanding, only, only seven thousand, which I think it would would handle every single blockchain that we've got on on Coin Market Cap that's actually in operation. I think that's about maybe. 13% of its, you know, total capacity. Yep. So it, it, it wouldn't even break into a sweat with that. But of course, the moment you start to get maybe EOS for Next and some of the other, some major apps launching on this with huge, huge transaction volume, you can see how maybe five or six of these start to roll out, taking 10% each, and you're going to start nearing uh, network capacity, which is where multi-threading comes in and this whole concept of inter-blockchain communication. And for for a block producer, you've suddenly got a whole nother level of support that's required for that. Right. Um, there, there's going to be massive infrastructure investment required. And that's where the block rewards come in, which is paid for by inflation and therefore means that we have a model more in, aligned with the internet, which is this whole concept of, and this is the same with Steam. It doesn't cost you money to sign up to Steam and to use it and to, to, to vote things up and down, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you had Steam on Ethereum, if, if it moves to proof of stake, you would still have an end cost at the moment being applied to the users or, or somehow being having to be picked up in a different way for transaction costs. Right. Um, and that's one of its biggest challenges, I think, that they're going to have to try and work out how to address. How do you do away with gas and try and compete with a model that has no transaction fees? 
Yeah. How do you do away with gas and have a proof of work system that has the counterparty risk of all that electricity? You know, we just saw in the state of New York that the government approved that um, electricity providers can charge known Bitcoin miners more for a kilowatt hour than they would for a standard customer. I, you know, I just heard that. And actually, Ash, let me ask you a question. In terms of alignment of interests, if you look at miners on proof of work, you, uh, you actually have to ask the question. You, we were talking about alignment of interests of, of ourselves as a, as a BP mm -hmm. on delegated proof of stake. Our interests are aligned with the voters. They have to be. Sure. And the voters. Do. So actually, if you ask the question to yourself, what are proof of work uh, miners' interests? Where, where is the alignment? And the answer is money. Yep. And the answer is the generation of coins. So it's cheap electricity to generate money. Yep. So the biggest question you then have to throw back to yourself with Ethereum is if they move and, and Casper gets fully integrated, what are the miners going to do? Are they going to yep. accept that with all that expensive hardware or is there going to be a, another big hard fork of Ethereum? Coming? Yeah, there's going to be a revolt and you're going to have, you know, yep. Ethereum proof of work and Ethereum proof of stake. You know, I'm, I'm quite bearish on the idea of Ethereum actually being able to implement the, the Great Freeze or the Ice Age or whatever they call it to push these miners out of the proof of work system that they have. I just, I can't see it happening. I can't see them scaling nearly as quickly as they need to in this super quick um, technological space of blockchain. I mean, right now, Ethereum can do 35 transactions per second. You can see if you go to blocktivity.info, the website blocktivity.info, you can see that the Steam blockchain, which is again, one of the predecessors of EOS, where Dan really began, not began, but continued learning what it takes to build a solid usable blockchain. This was the first one with free transactions that can handle, you know, 100,000 transactions per second. It does around pretty much every day, 50% of all the on-chain transactions of all blockchains combined. It does every single day about a million and a half on-chain transactions every single day. Typically, Ethereum may be second place, BitShares may be second place, and then Bitcoin is typically fourth, and it's not even close. Maybe Bitcoin does 150, 200,000 um, transactions for a 24-hour period, and it maxes out, right? You see 200,000 transactions in the mempool, where that wouldn't even be 1% of the capacity of Steam or of EOS. And EOS is going to be much quicker. You know, it's going to be able to process much more than Steam does with a much shorter block time as well, a half a second instead of three seconds. Um, you mentioned something about the inflation paying for the block producers in EOS, which I found really interesting. I just gave a presentation here at the Bitcoins and Bali meetup on using voluntary inflation to support digital communities. And nobody really thinks about this. You know, we've had the U.S. government or the British government or whatever government you have that you're listening to this podcast. Your government is constantly creating new money and coming from an Austrian economics background. Printing new money or the creation of new money is inflation. That is an inflating of the currency supply. It just happens that the government gets access to that money first and they give it out to their friends and their cronies and the businesses that they want to protect. Wall Street, foreign governments, uh, you know, bailouts for banks and car manufacturers and the pharmaceutical industry and the military industrial complex. And they're giving the inflation out to the people that they want to support. In Bitcoin, 100% of the Bitcoin inflation goes out to the miners. In Steam, part of it goes to the, the witnesses, part of it goes to the content creators and the curators, and there's a bit more intelligent use of inflation. We haven't had a long time in history where the idea of voluntary inflation has existed. Typically, we've been locked in these force-based economic systems like the US dollar or, or the pound sterling, and we've been the bag holders, essentially, for paying for the new inflation that gets created and passed out to the government's friends. And we pay for that through debasement of our currency. Now in EOS, David, how is the inflation used? I know you mentioned to pay for the block producers, but how else are the new EOS tokens that get generated used? And how does that strengthen the EOS community? So, so there are a, a range of debates right now globally about how block producer rewards um, should actually be used. So there is a, a school of thought that's quite 
dominant, I would say, led by the likes of ourselves, EOS 42, EOS New York, and a number of the others, um, you know, leading block producers, which is, says that it should be entirely focused around um, adding value back into the community in a variety of ways. It can be education of the community. It can be um, providing distributed apps for them that are community um, apps. It could be all sorts of other things like that. Which, and of course, the, the biggest single one is is uh, that massive in investment in the infrastructure to enable the, the network to scale. Sure. At, if, if you think about that, the, the inherent value of tokens has to be linked to its capacity as well. So when you're spending a fortune investing in future hardware to enable that scaling capacity, it's adding value to the tokens, everybody's tokens. Um, they become more valuable by their, their capability to do that. Um, but so, so in effect, there's a direct correlation there between uh, inflation uh, in, in this new sense um, and adding value to tokens. But it's a hard one to get people's uh, minds around. They, they see inflation as a bad thing traditionally and rightly so in some ways, uh, particularly when it gets to Venezuelan levels. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's therefore for them, it, it's, a tough, uh, it's a tough one to understand that in this new system, Inflation is not necessarily an enemy. Maybe excessive inflation is, but that's part of the voting me mechanism again, which is different block producers can propose between one and five percent their own inflation, um, you know, proposal on launch, and it's going to be for the voters to, des to decide. Do I want the guy who's, who's proposing five percent or one percent? Actually, if they're proposing one percent, are they are they actually taking enough hit to adequately invest in the network? This is this is an informed vote versus maybe a willful ignorant vote where you go, inflation's bad. I'm going for only block producers that that are going to go for between zero and one percent. Well, yeah. to me, that, that, that also would suggest if they are still able to fund infrastructure, how else are they backed? You know, then you have to look at conflicts of interest and right. say, have they, have they got additional backing here that means that they are potentially trying to buy their way into multiple BPs? And yeah, you, so you, you as a voter have a, a range of complex issues to, to take into account here when, when considering what is a good or a bad inflation rate and what is a good or a bad block producer. Yeah, and I remember Dan saying that one of the issues with bit shares back in the day is the token holders voted on zero inflation. So they didn't have that new um, tokens being created to fund their network and to fund their community. And you know, Dan stepped in and, and helped correct that. But that I think that was one of the big reasons that bit shares didn't take off like it could because they had economic problems because the token holders voted for no inflation, probably because they were a bunch of uh, gold and silver and hard money advocates like myself. And we've been <laughs> taught that inflation is bad, but inflation is only bad whenever you're forced into that economic system. You can always just leave. If you think that your money's community and your the digital economy that your money is used in has too much inflation, guess what? Sell all of your EOS tokens and buy Bitcoin or buy Ethereum or buy whatever token well, you want. Well, don't forget, they have high inflation right now through proof of, of work as well. Sure, uh, uh, of course. In, in effect, they do. You know, you're right. There aren't many um, systems that have zero inflation. Um, but if they do, you have to look at the alternative. In, in a world of zero inflation, what else actually does that mean? Well, if, if in that case, the, uh, the, the, the BPs, the block producers, will need to find a source of income to pay for all these expensive networks. External, they could right. be saying, yeah, well, no, what it actually means is how does that work? Well, in that case, we're going to have to charge you for every block that we, we actually process. Right. For every transaction, there, there's a name for that. It's called gas, right? So if we <laughs> yeah, want gas, exactly. go for zero inflation, right? <laughs> and right. Uh, and, and, and that, then you're in, the, in this cycle. And you can see where Dan came up with the, the very elegant solution for this, which was looking at uh, inflation as a positive thing, which can inject uh, investment at the source level back into the community. So I think it's a brilliant um, model, provided it's not abused, but actually it goes back to that whole equally elegant side of the model, which is the alignment of interests uh, and block producers are there to serve the network and serve the voters. Yeah. So provided that that never gets to a point of over-centralization, it should always be able to, I think, bring it back into alignment if there is a point of uh, you know, realizing that, that block producers maybe are getting out of line in some way. Sure. And, you know, block producers are entrepreneurs in the EOS system, but, and yeah. they get rewarded from the inflation, but they're not the only entrepreneurs that get rewarded from inflation. One really interesting aspect of EOS that I, I find fascinating is that whenever you hold the token and stake the token, that gives you access to the resources of the network. 
So if you need hard drive space, you need RAM, you need bandwidth, you stake your tokens and you get access to those resources. If you no longer need those resources, then you can unstake your tokens and sell them or do whatever you want to with them. But you stake your tokens with entrepreneurs and businesses that are built on top of EOS that offer the services that you need either to use the network or to build on the network. Let's say you're building a wallet or something and, and you need throughput, you need capacity, you need storage space, you, know, you need a database. Well, you could stake your tokens with these various service providers and get those services at no additional cost. But whenever the new inflation comes and is created, it looks, the blockchain looks and sees, okay, where are the EOS tokens staked? And that tells it where to pay out that inflation. Of course, one of those is with the block producers. But again, this, and Brendan Bloomer, the CEO of Block One, says this very eloquently. He's like, this aligns inflation with entrepreneurs and businesses. It aligns the creation of new money with building the infrastructure of the EOS network, which you know, I found very fascinating. And it brings me to uh, Shintai, which is, uh, an, uh, an, I guess we would call it an app or a marketplace, or what is Shintai? Why is the EOS42 block producer candidates creating it, and how does it serve the community? Yeah, so, so I suppose it, it partly came off the back of my background in finance and trading systems and order management, right? So, so I, I was equally fascinated by the concept of what, what is an EOS token actually do and it and the answer is it, it guarantees you a minimum percentage of bandwidth or cpu within the overall system so if you're a, yeah as you rightly say if you're a, an entrepreneur setting up an application uh on top of eos you need to either hold tokens physically uh, a reserve of those or you need to lease them uh, and i started looking ahead at all of this and thinking that's great that's great where's the leasing market where's the leasing functionality i had a look through the code base with, with a couple of other people and was kind of, I, I can see stake and unstake here, and that's used for leasing and voting in theory. There's nothing above that, above the protocol layer here that actually has a leasing contract. So I started talking to some people and, and started sounding out the likes of Sandwich, uh, a block one guy, and, and, and asking them the question, is there such a thing as a leasing market being built by block one? And the answer was, we don't believe so. You know, you don't get a, a yes or a no with, right, with right. this sort of thing. So, right. So from that, Shintai was, was uh, conceptualized, Shintai being the Japanese for lease. Um, and what I want, wanted to find and do with that was to produce a really efficient marketplace system that would benefit the entire community. So uh, that was the driver for me and, and finding a number of other people across the community that had the same kind of idea. There were disparate projects uh, maybe starting to form out of the back of this. Most of them were had the idea ah, this is a great business opportunity, right? Uh, if you've ever seen Minnow Booster on uh, Steam, they, they've got a whole business model off this. Um, but but this, this is where being a block producer kicked in with, with the, the, the alignment of interests because I instantly saw an opportunity here to provide feeless leasing for both sides by funding it with block producer rewards. And it's a, it's a huge value add for the community. It's a huge potential win, right, for, for BPs trying to compete to actually um, align their interests as well. Um, and, and, and that was the proposal that went out in the white paper, therefore to make this a fearless platform, to make it highly sophisticated over time, mm. to, to fund its ongoing development, to fund its ongoing running costs once it's actually up and running, um, once we, we reach June, um, and to enable people to, in effect, um, eventually get to a point where they can place uh, an order out in the future between a given time zone um, or, or, or right there in the current period too, and, and to actually lease um, X amount of tokens out or, or likewise to, to lease them um, uh, as, as a distributed app that needs them and, and provides uh, you know, that, that service to both sides of them. If you look at EOS, leasing is an economic essential. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, not, it's probably fair to say this is a community project. I've been trying to push that from day one. This is not really EOS 42. You know, the fact that we are the ones that were involved in the, the, the white paper you know, a lot of other block producers and very smart people in the community are involved and the core team already that's building up. Um, it, it's, you know, we're just a part of that. And, uh, and I think that's the way any good idea should be in a distributed community project like this. It's going to be other block producers are going to come up, uh, going to come up with good ideas too. And unless they're planning to fund and develop the whole thing in-house themselves, 
it's going to be the same thing and we'll probably back and support them and, and get involved where we can as well. And I, I love that about seeing the community at this early stage like this. It's full of doers who are there for the right reasons, which is just inspirational for me. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in your public telegram group, um, I was surprised to see representatives from so many block producer candidates, uh, you know, from London, from New York, uh, 42, I mean, from um, yeah, I can't. We, we've got support from Australia, Eosphere from Australia, um, Eos Detroit um, have declared, e Eos DAC, which is the one of the big distributed DAC-based um, uh, BP candidates that's kicked in. So I think we've got support at the moment declared from five um, mm. BPs, including ourselves, although I suspect that number will go up as we, we get nearer the websites going live soon, uh, the, the, the technical design papers coming out soon. Um, so we, we're starting to get some project momentum kicking off behind this being just a a white paper and a, and a telegram group but for sure it's it's going to start to become much more visible to people that this isn't going away this is going to get done and it was helped by the likes of thomas cox a week ago on eos radio confirming he, in a personal capacity he, he can't speak for block one as you as you know um but uh, he was able to at least confirm from his understanding that there is no lease contract going to be built and it gave us a, a, a lot more certainty therefore that we need to uh, to push forward for this yeah, and I'm actually surprised that there is no lease contract going to be included in the in like the native EOS code because it was in Steam. You know, you don't need to use Minnow Booster to delegate to another account. You can go straight to a, a URL and you, know, you say who you want to lease to and how much you want to lease. Why do you think they didn't include um, the leasing facilities in EOS natively? Uh, my, my view is actually not that they don't want to. They haven't got the time. Right, um, okay. But, what they've done with software development, and this is always a very, very tricky one, is up front, they've set a date when the software is going live <laughs> right. with, an, with an incredibly complex build, incredibly complex functionality, lots of different considerations being ongoing. Uh, is it really surprising that they are probably going, this is super tight for time as we get nearer and nearer the deadline? Uh, stuff like this, they're probably going, this would be a nice to add maybe in August, September. Um, if there's a community project ongoing, hopefully we, we might be able to get some support from from them in, in pushing that forward from our side. But they've always said this from day one: we are not we are here as a software company, is for the right. community to lead on this yeah. stuff. And and I thought, what what better example to maybe show some leadership for the community than us getting out there and putting this forward, a, a, a real vision of how to do this well. You know, there, there's all sorts of ways you can price and price match and algorithmic mm -hmm. price pricing and all sorts of uh, quite advanced functionality we can put in there that goes way beyond Minnow Booster. Mm -hmm. this, this to me needs to be a commercial app that, that in terms of its industrial scale. For you sure. could have thousands, millions of people in theory further down the line using this. Once you've got into blockchain communication, this thing could be used for leasing other tokens. Sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's all sorts of quite advanced um, things you have to think about with, with what will Shintai be capable of doing. And that's not all, you know, for, for one person to decide. It's going to be for the community to actually mm -hmm. own this and actually propose those, that functionality and for the, the, the development community who uh, hopefully some of them will be full-time on this once we start funding that as well um, to actually build this out. And, and probably people, you know what they'll be like, but two or three years down the line, they'll just be, oh, yeah, Shintai's the place you go for all your leasing. There'll be no awareness of, of the underlying build and effort that went into it. It'll just be accepted as this, this utility right. uh, that's part, part of EOS that everyone just takes. Probably the same will be the same for Scatter, right? It's exactly the same kind of principle there as well. People won't think about all that work that went into it or, or, or anything like that. They would just go, that's the place you go for, for that. For that. So yeah. it's, it's good though. Uh, th this is the exciting times for me, that, you know, when we're, we're building the infrastructure like this. Yeah, super exciting times. And I want to back it up just a little bit because I know a lot of my audience is very familiar with cryptocurrencies, but pro probably not EOS specifically. And I just wanted to give two examples, both sides of who would delegate and who would receive delegation of EOS. So let's start with who would receive, who would want to, to buy delegated EOS tokens. It would be, um, you know, a DAP developer, a, a team that wants to build on top of EOS. And again, they need resources in order to use the network, to use the blockchain. They need bandwidth, they need storage capacity, they need RAM, right? They have two options. They can buy the EOS tokens or, and, and stake those and get access to those resources, or they can lease them from someone who's not using them. And of course, whenever you lease something from someone, you're gonna pay them a fee for the temporary 
um, ability to use those tokens to unlock those resources. So what if you're, what if you're a startup and you need a whole lot of resources up front as you make a big push? Well, you could buy all those tokens, but maybe you don't need all those resources for the entire duration. Uh, maybe it's a short-term type thing, maybe six months or three months that you need that additional um, onset of resources. You could go rent those from someone that wasn't using them. And you know, who knows what the percentage, or what the interest rate or what the fees are gonna be that someone is going to desire to get paid in order for you to lease their tokens. You can go to Minnow Booster and check out you know, what a, a much more simple but still elegant um, solution for this on the Steam blockchain. Uh, you can see everything from 1% per year that you're gonna get to I've seen over 40% APR per year that you're going to get for leasing out your tokens. On the Steam blockchain, you really only rent delegated tokens, if you will, in order to increase your upvote strength. So maybe if you had 500 Steam, your upvote's gonna be worth about seven, eight cents. If you lease another 50,000 Steam, maybe your upvote now is worth uh, $17 instead of that seven cents. In EOS, it's gonna be a much larger marketplace because you're not just dealing with upvote strength, you're dealing with the resources of the blockchain itself. So an EOS token holder, maybe an investor, someone who doesn't have plans to build on the, the network and the blockchain, can see residual income coming in, quite passive income and very safe because it's um, bound by a smart contract. And so you don't have to worry about someone running off with your tokens or not being able to repay the loan because they never take ownership of your tokens. They only take temporary control of your tokens, which I find is really revolutionary in the lease lending space itself, you know, especially coming from, I mean, you could tell better than anyone coming from the banking industry, uh, you know, they have to do all this due diligence and risk mitigation on who's going to pay back or who has a higher risk of not paying back their loans. Well, in, in the delegated proof of stake system, there's no chance that somebody isn't going to pay you back because they don't have ownership of your tokens. They just temporary control over them. Uh, th did I do a pretty good job there? Is that, do you want to add anything? You, you did. I think the only thing that, um, a slight correction, and this is only because Dan announced it probably in the last couple of weeks, is that RAM is not going to be uh, leasable. Oh, right. And, and, the reason, and the reason is apparently that he wants to stop the risk of people squatting. Um, Domain, you know, and taking up RAM. RAM is a precious resource for block producers. So that that one's out here. That's why at the moment, and at least on my understanding, is it's it's CPU and uh, bandwidth. And, and bandwidth only. Yeah, right. um, and storage. Whereas, I mean, my big concern was actually, yeah, yeah, absolutely. My my big concern was um, was voting actually. Could, right. Could you, yeah. Could you, could you lease out votes? You know, and I mean, right. you think about that for a second. Then it, it could get could get very interesting, shall we say? And that one's also been ruled out, thankfully. Uh, you can delegate votes, into, incidentally. That's another thing that's a feature of delegated proof of stake. If you want to to, to say, for example, that look, this guy Ash, he, he's far more informed about EOS than me. I, I own, you know, X thousand, maybe a couple of thousand tokens here. I'm going to just delegate them to him so he can vote on my behalf and make a more informed decision on the benefit for the benefit of the network. That, that is actually something that people will be able to do, from my understanding. Um, so that's that's quite an interesting um, feature too, and um, and I think that's something that I've seen Dan actually comment on before. He would almost uh, welcome people making uh, delegations to people they believe to be informed. Yeah, I think in Steam you can do the same thing, and it's called proxy voting. I, I would be, uh, yeah, I, I believe that that's uh, what okay. it's called. Yeah, yep. yeah. proxy voting. Uh, and, and again, you know, you vote for a block producer candidate. So if you have a couple thousand EOS and you, you don't have enough financial stake to keep up with what are these block producers offering or who are they, how much respect do they have or trust, then if you know someone, let's say, you know, your friend Bob who has a couple tens of thousands or a hundred thousand EOS, he's got a lot more to, in stake to keep up with the network. You can just proxy vote through him. And, you know, I, I see benefits to that, but I also see some warnings there. What if we get these big voting factions that people just don't pay attention and now you have, you know, 100,000 people that have 1,000 EOS and they're not incentivized enough to keep check on you, the proxy voter. And, you know, I, I don't know how that really plays out. I think that voting, the percentage of voting is quite low in Steam at the moment. I'm really curious to see what percentage of token holders um, actually vote in EOS. But it's, you know, June the 1st is 
theoretically the launch day i know that the block one team is not launching the blockchain which seems very strange that they would create this open source software then not launch their own blockchain but this is how it happened in BitShares, and this is how it happened in steam as well so there is a precedent for whatever reasons we won't get into that on why the code creators the code producers don't launch their own blockchain they do it in a community fashion but i don't think there's any risk of of the es blockchain not getting launched i think there's a higher probability of multiple instances of the es blockchain getting launched but yeah, that may be sure. yeah that may be yeah. a different conversation um, it's actually june 2nd is going to be by the way between about 6 uh 6 a.m and, and probably midday uh london time that that will be the, the probably the first chain launch but that is going to be a requirement after the, the during the first of June for that snapshot file of the uh, all of the the token holdings and, and across all the accounts to be produced, published out, um, and then you're reliant on obviously block producers getting the, the together to right. actually uh, you know in, in, to, to launch the first chain. Yeah. So well, before yeah. before we wrap up here, David, is there anything else about EOS forty two or about the Shintai delegation market that you'd like to get into? Uh, I mean, I, I think it would be really good, actually, if, if anybody who's considering voting um, takes the time to start following EOS Go uh, publication on, on the different block producers. I, you know, I, I don't think it's just about us. We're just, we are one candidate. Um, we've got some very strong views on, on the, how the system should be run. You know, that's a, a big part of it is we're trying to demonstrate with action with, with Shintai. Is, is give back to the community and pu putting together these sorts of things. We'll be publishing out fairly imminently our hardware plans. And the only reason we've held off is we're waiting for block one guidance on this, um, but they're not giving it. So on that basis, we are gonna have to publish out our hardware plans and, and just, I think, bite the bullet on that. But um, I think it's really important that voters try and find out as much as they can about all the different uh, block producers that are out there. I think there's probably about 35 so far, you know, it could be up to 121 by launch that, that could credibly get voted in as backups, 100 backups, 21 block producers. Um, they're going to have a different variety. I mean, some of them are even um, in certain countries talking about trying to paper vote. That, that may be outlawed in the Constitution. If it is, then in theory, that will go away. Um, other, others have got views on um, uh, all sorts of things. You know, I've got a very strong view coming from a, a finance background. I, I watched banks misbehave under the surface. And in a way, I wasn't aware working on the inside for 10 years of my career. I have a very strong view, and we've, we've published an article on our website uh, that I would encourage people to take a look at about why um, there should be a block producer integrity fund. Mm. So a small proportion of the block producer funds will actually go out, a very, very small percentage, to, to have uh, as a bounty fund. That's managed by the commun a community committee, and that in incentivizes people to actually go out and keep an eye on the behavior of all the different individuals globally working within these, these block producers. And you can set up a nice structured uh, structure around that whereby it's not some sort of witch hunt where block, block where bounty hunter behavior is also has to be carefully um, uh, controlled and can be, there can be complaints about them if they misbehave too and they're trying to, you know, entrap in, in a really um, inappropriate way. But if they find, for example, that, you know, we, we've got, so we've, we've currently got five people globally, um, but by the time we launch or, or in a year's time, we might have 15. If one of those misbehaves and starts being open to bribes, let's sure. say, to, to do something, you as a block producer want to know that. You, mm -hmm. you up front, you can bet that probably the majority of people are, are going to be good within there, and it would be extremely helpful to have a structured process where a, a community committee takes that back to them. Maybe it goes to an arbitration, maybe a fine is issued, maybe you get the opportunity to, you know, get rid of that person out of there and make a joint statement to the community with, in a transparent way after that process has happened, which says, right, actually in that case, this is what happened. This is the, this is the decision that was made. Maybe they've had a fine of this and they've taken this action. Um, and, and the community can step back and make its own judgments then with regards to votes on this sort of thing. But the point is, everybody has to be accountable to somebody. And I don't approve of the idea of block producers sitting there with the power they have in theory to misbehave. Yeah. not being oversighted carefully by the committee by the community that's my view yeah. um and that's 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 the sort of thing that you know you'll you'll find um by by following and finding out more about 
these different block reduces. Everyone's going to have different views. So. Yeah, and and I expect that we're going to have multiple organizations, like you know, looking at block producers and giving them ratings. I mean, this this is free market regulation right here. We don't need the heavy hand of the government coming in and regulating this. Like, we will no. self organize, and we will have people who are just really freaking passionate about you know making sure that at first maybe their block producer is is acting correctly and then that the block producer candidates are i mean all, all the other block producer competition is acting correctly and i think it's a great use of inflation to to have someone or have multiple people going out there watching each other watching the block producers and it's it's really amazing i, I will say that i'm a part of quite a few of the eos telegram groups um, and there is so much positivity and energy of building and energy of cooperation. And I, I jump into some of these other telegram groups or you see it on Twitter and it's like, while Bitcoin core and Bitcoin cash bitch and moan and fight and complain, the o EOS community is quietly building. And when this thing launches, it's going to take a lot of people by surprise, which is really funny because people like us and hopefully like people in my audience, if you're paying attention to what's being built right now and you look back on previous proven blockchains that, for instance, Dan Lammer has built, you can see what it were the, the stepping stones of what's being built here. And it's just a really awesome community. I second EOS Go. I read those guys every single day. I've got them on my auto voter on Steam, so I'm supporting them financially. And yeah, they do a great job. Basically. Yeah, basically they, yeah, go, they go through all the Telegram groups. Uh, they give you the cliff notes. I don't know if people have cliff notes any, anymore, but back, back in the day, you know, before the interwebs, we bought cliff notes and it gives you like the short form, the most important parts of the Telegram conversations. And it'll show that Dan jumps in or Thomas jumps in or you jump in. I've seen your name pop up in EOS Go recently. And it just shows you like what's the activity, what's the conversation, what's going on in the governance channel, what's going on in the design channel, what's going on in the developers channel, you know, what's going on in the marketing channel. And it's just a, a really awesome resource. So if you if you haven't checked it out yet, go to busy.org and find the EOS Go account and sub, at least subscribe every day. And if you if you have an auto voter, put them on there. They need your support. It's a, it's a great way to um, stay fairly informed on what's going on with Telegram because it's otherwise, it, it's Woo. very tough to, to stay up, up to date otherwise. But yeah. You're, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's a great service they're offering. And yeah, Kevin Blue Jays are doing a great job with it all. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, any shout outs you want to give to your team or people that support you? And how do we find you on the internet? Uh, so we are eos42.io. Um, nice, nice and simple on that. And um, we're also eos42.io on, on, on Twitter as well. Um, but in terms of shout outs, I, I mean, I, I just think, look, uh, the, uh, we've got an awesome team already, right? I mean, Charles, uh, I met him through the community in back in the early January and, and the guy just popped up and, and he's a perfect synergy for me, right? He's super technical, he's infrastructure, he's hardware, he's He's, he's just incredibly talented in everything he's doing. And then we've met through the community, back through, through Shintai as well. We met um, Sean Cook and uh, uh, Liam Wu. Um, and both of them, again, they, they are great for now. Um, not, not just um, Liam, for example, is leading a lot of work uh, about building out design uh, and marketing within standards, within EOS, within EOS sorry, itself. And that's, that's part of his passion that he wants to do that. They're also great for also helping us engage with these other communities um, in, in Korea um, and China and, and the Spanish speaking communities globally too. And I think, again, it just represents as, as uh, we get nearer and nearer the go live, um, all the block producers are going to be looking to, to bring more and more people into their teams because it is, it's going to be a giant community fund fueled team, team basis for me, I think in most cases. Yeah. Awesome. Um, the, the global, I mean, you're, Telegram group is uh, t.me slash Shintai EOS. That's C-H-I-N-T-A-I-E-O-S. I will include all of your social media links in the show notes, David. I'll include a link um, to the white paper as well. As soon as yeah, I, 
yeah, as soon as I heard about the project, I jumped right into the white paper and, and started making a little bit of a noise in your in your Telegram group. You and did, I, yeah. <laughs> but in a good way, I might add. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs, David. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. We went about an hour, so this has been a great conversation. Oh, wow. This is my first <laughs> interview with uh, someone specifically about EOS. So thank you so much for coming on, and I'm sure we'll be in touch. Pleasure. Thanks a lot, Ash. Yeah, take care. Thanks.